Uh, hello. Um, as, uh, as he so graciously mentioned, uh, my name is Elizabeth Sampat. I make a lot of weird shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you know who I am, it's probably either because I made an, a game about uh, sharing your most vulnerable self with a group of strangers called Deadbolt, or because I make a lot of bad jokes and yell about social justice on Twitter. Um, I fucking love Twitter. Uh, Twitter, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter changed my life because it's a system that allows me to sort of interact with people while bypassing all of the problems that I have with empathy. Um, most people don't actually know that there are two different types of empathy. There's emotional empathy, which is when people feel in their gut how other people are feeling. And then there's cognitive empathy, which is when people are able to consciously read the external signs of how other people are feeling and then react appropriately. Um, there's a thing with a lot of abuse victims, see, where they shut off their cognitive empathy entirely because they can't trust it. Uh, when you don't know if someone is, something is going to make someone happy or make them lash out at you, you just stop trying to read their body language or their tone. You stop trying to figure out what their appropriate response is in a situation based on those things. And instead, you end up subconsciously relying pretty heavily on your emotional empathy. You become hypersensitive to things, uh, feelings in a room, and maybe even become a little bit paranoid. You pay attention so you know when and how to flee, but those are really the only tools you have in any social situation. And that's me, in a nutshell. Uh, when I was younger, I actually used systems to piece together a facsimile of cognitive empathy, sort of using a series of if-then statements. Um, in high school, I used it to, to stay under the radar. So as an example, let's say, Jennifer asks you if you're going to prom. If she, if other girls are around, then see if they're watching you. Uh, if those girls are laughing, then Jennifer's probably trying to make fun of you. Uh, my systems worked with varying degrees of su success. And then, sometimes, despite trying not to attract attention, people would want to get to know me better. You know, be friends. I have a lot of social anxiety, as you might imagine, so this used to cause a lot of panic in my head. Uh, the people who said they cared about me most in my formative years were the people who hurt me the most. So the idea of having friends or loved ones didn't really appeal to me. In college, I figured out new systems to keep people at arm's length, to push people away. And once again, my systems worked with varying degrees of success. Systems kept me safe. When nothing else would soothe me, I had systems. When my life was in shambles, I'd fall into the soothing rhythm of system. When I found myself in awkward or uncomfortable social situations and I didn't know what to do next, systems told me. At some point in my 20s, after living in six states and moving over 20 times and having two great kids and two failed marriages, I realized that maybe I didn't have to be alone. Maybe I could let people in, but at that point in my life, I didn't know how. I didn't know who I was, and I didn't know where to start. And that's when system saved me. Even when I didn't want to be known, I wanted to be understood, and I wanted to understand the world around me. I tried to meet these goals with writing initially, but I felt like my writing was too transparent, that there wasn't enough distance for me to feel safe. So instead, I was a professional photographer for 10 years. Photography was great because it gave me, it allowed me to craft photos that communicated my feelings on an emotional level without any cognitive bias. It gave me exactly what I wanted. People could feel exactly what I wanted them to feel without me having to explain why I wanted them to feel that way or what those feelings meant to me. It was an elegant way to feign intimacy with strangers. But nothing has ever or will ever touch the beauty of system. When I started designing games, I realized that I could explicitly model the way my brain works, or the way that I wished my brain worked, or the way that something made me feel, and I could share those systems with other people. That without having to awkwardly swap stories or talk about things that were painful for, to me, or that made other people uncomfortable, without small talk, 
I could get other people to operate under my constraints. I could understand them better by seeing how they'd operate under the constraints that I was under, and they could understand me better by submitting to sy systems similar to the ones that I made for myself. Best of all, I could interact with people without worrying about a lack of cognitive empathy because I was already intimately familiar with the rules behind our interactions. And like, deep down, that's really all I've ever wanted. I want to understand and to be understood. I have an overabundance of curiosity and a shit ton of emotional empathy, and it's taken me 30 years to figure out what to do with it all. If whatever's going on with me is like an ep inside of me is like an episode of Hoarders, right? Then systems, then making games, is me organizing this stuff into something that somehow makes sense. And along the way, I've managed to unearth things I didn't even know were there. I feel like if there's any compelling argument for how games are really art, it's how much of ourselves we put into the things that we make. Like any good piece of art, a good game reveals something about the person who made it, whether or not the revelation is intentional. And also, look, I don't know why you make things if you're the kind of person who makes things. But for me, for a lot of artists, there's usually a very specific audience in mind. The desire to understand and to be understood is enough to make me design, see, but for the best things I've ever made, there had to be someone specific that I was designing for. I remember reading an interview with Vonnegut where he said that every single book he ever made was for an audience of one, his sister, just laser honed to her particular tastes. Even after she died, everything he wrote was for her. And I get that. Despite what you may believe after witnessing this intense oversharing at a public professional game conference, I really only get the motivation and the inspiration to design when I know the part of myself I want to share and I know who I want to share it with. Some of my most promising game designs never made it out of purgatory because I lacked the audience in my head. The first game I ever worked on was called Addict and it was about the cycle of hitting bottom, striving to be better, codependency and recidivism. It was possible to win Addict, but it was not probable. The game was dedicated to my mother, who is a lovely woman who I hope never knows about the game or sees this talk. Maybe I'll finish it if she dies, if I find the right audience. The game, I mean, not this talk. I don't want to be up here that long. Um, my first published game was actually about dysfunctional people having layers of one-sided relationships while trying to figure out how to conceal and when to reveal the, the neuroses and the reasons behind those neuroses. Yeah, it's even called It's Complicated. And can you believe that I published it in 2008 and it took me until this year to be appropriately mortified by its transparency? I thought I was making a game about all of my favorite dramedies, like Pushing Daisies or Royal Tenenbaums or whatever the kids are watching these days. But at the core of the system was a part of myself, the part of the dramedies that I loved and I didn't realize existed within me as well. I made it complicated for a friend's birthday. Uh, we've been roommates for the last five years, so I guess it worked out pretty well. Like I said before, I've always been a closed off person, and the thing that I found useful about every game I'd made previously is that it gave me the distance necessary to explore topics that were too close to me. There's a whisper of what I wanted to do with Addict in the core loop of It's Complicated, and then I made a game called Blowback about renegade spies on the surface, but the systems that govern their interactions with loved ones pretty closely model PTSD. I made a game about fallen angels co being torn between God and humanity while they try to do what they think is right, and let's just say that forging your own path while dealing with conflicting loyalties is something with which I am intimately familiar. That game, called They Became Flesh, was the game that I, I made that I felt was the most naked, honest reflection who, of who I was as a, as a person for a really long time. And then I made Deadbolt. Deadbolt, the game about sharing your most vulnerable self with seven other people, was a real departure for me in a number of ways. I dated an artsy kid in college who was fond of saying, without distance, there is no art. And for a long time, I agreed. But that's just another excuse to not completely engage. 
to not give myself fully to what I'm making. And as a result, for a long time, I didn't have to reveal myself fully to the people I was making games for or with. The thing that's terrifying about Deadbolt, the thing that makes it worth it, is that there's no distance. When I designed it, I methodically went through and stripped out every single excuse that I could come up with, every single way I could find to hide or disengage. I took out everything that made me feel safe when I create and exist within systems, and I ripped it out until all that was left was a straightforward way to give yourself to another person and be given something in return. So, that's the neuroses that inspired my game. That just leaves the audience. I guess all it took was meeting someone like me, but better. Someone who engages in conversational judo, who listens more than they talk at a party. Someone with a fundamental core of tension and nervousness layered under calm and safety. I befriended someone who mastered being understood without ever really being known. And I realized, you know, I don't just want to pick the locks that are hiding whatever is at the core of this person who is now my best friend. I want reciprocity. These are locks that I built myself decades ago, and I've lost the keys, if the keys ever even existed. The only way for me to reach out to others is by reaching through myself. Design for me has always been so fucking careful. It's been a way to exert control in a world where I've spent most of my life powerless. Systems have helped me examine and overcome some of the worst things that have ever happened to me, and they've allowed me to become better. But I don't want to be careful anymore. I want something more than care. Don't get me wrong, deep down, I still feel like I need to be careful, like it's a necessity. But I'm making some new systems, and I don't want to jinx it, but they seem to be working with varying degrees of success. So yeah, I'm Elizabeth, and I am inspired by the ways in which I am broken and the ways in which I am mending. <laughs>